All right. Come on, somebody. I'm excited for church today. Come on. You ready? You glad to be in church? Come on. I'm thankful to have a furnace. I'm thankful to have cameras for live stream for those at home. I'm so grateful that church was able to happen today because I believe that the Lord has something to say as we're continuing our We Can't Stay Here series. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. As we step into this new year, we're putting a stake in the ground to say that we're not going to stay where we've been. Okay, we're not going to settle for the status quo or what God has done in the past, but instead we're going to passionately pursue the next thing that God has for us. And we're using the story of Israel's journey to the promised land to guide our conversation. And if you remember, Deuteronomy is a sermon preached by or a sermon preached by Moses to all of Israel shortly before his death. And at the time of his sermon, the Israelites, they are standing on the border of the promised land, on the eastern border, and they are getting ready to take the land. And in chapter 1, Moses recounts some of the highlights of Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness that, or that led up to this moment. And he wants them to remember what God has done and learn from their wilderness journey as they step into this new season. And we're looking at that journey to gather some principles for ourselves as we step into 2024 and all the new things that God has for us. And last week we looked at verses 6 through 8 where Moses recalls that after a year of being on Mount Sinai, God told them that they could not stay on the mountain anymore. God had done great things on the mountain. They had encountered his presence, but they could not stay there. If they wanted to take hold of what God had for them, they needed to leave the mountain and take the promised land. It says this in, in, in verse 6. It says, The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. I can't help but think that that's a prophetic word for some of us this morning, saying you have stayed long enough at this mountain. You can't stay here anymore. And he says this in verse 8. He says, see, I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. Okay, so there came a point where they had to leave what was comfortable. And we like comfortable, don't we? And they had to leave that and they had to take hold of God's future for them. In the same way, we need to leave the past behind and take hold of God's vision for this year. And we, and we talked about last week how we can do that through prayer and through mission. We are all about prayer here at Scent Church, and we are all about mission, right? We're going to contend with God, we're going to commune with God, and we're going to kick back the gates of hell by introducing people to Jesus Christ. If we want to take hold of what God has for us, we got to pray, and we got to go. And now this week, we're going to look at actually something else we need to do if we want to take hold of God's future, and, it, and it's going to start in verse 9. Let's see what it says here. So just picking it up right after where we left off last week. It says, at that time, I said to you, I'm not able to bear you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you. And behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. And may the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? And choose for your tribes wise understanding and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. And you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands and of hundreds and of fifties and of tens and officers throughout your tribes. And I charged your judges at the time, hear the case between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with him. And you shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. And you shall not be intimidated by anyone for the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, bring it to me and I'll hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. Okay, the sermon title this morning, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, is The Burden, The Burden. Let's go ahead and pray over this word. God, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house on this day, and we pray that you would speak. God, I pray that this would not be a speech, that this would not be just good ideas, but that this would be a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power. We came here this morning to encounter you, and we're not going to leave until we do, Lord, so we're asking you to have your way and to speak to every single heart in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So my wife, I have a secret. My wife is a superhero. Okay, she's a modern day superhero. If you didn't know, we have four crazy kids. They're, like, they're not just kids. They are crazy kids who are five and under, especially our two sons, Abram and Caleb. Man, they are 
are just nuts, right? If you call me at any time of the day and I'm at home, you're going to hear some yelling. You're going to hear some, some hitting. Well, hopefully not. We try, them, or try to get them not to hit each other or me. Sometimes they whack me. Anyways, they are, are very aggressive. And on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, I pick up our two oldest kids from preschool, and then I pick up our two youngest from daycare. And Emily works in Waverly, and, and she gets home about 30 minutes after we do. And I'm not trying to be dramatic, but those 30 minutes are the most intense 30 minutes of my day. I, I, I like, like, there's fear and trepidation going into those 30 minutes. I'm like, Lord, you got to help me. And, and, and while Emily seems to be able to handle all four kids on her own, I'm just not as skilled at it. Don't know if I'm just bad at my job or if it's something about being a mother. I don't know, but I just struggle with it more than she does. And for those 30 minutes to go well, I have to be at the top of my game. I have to have trained like, leading up to it, and I have to be ready. So, th- so this includes taking two to three trips from the garage to the kitchen to get all the kids inside. It includes getting Abram's shoes off before he yells at me, shoes off, shoes off, shoes off. I'm like, buddy, I'm getting them, I promise. It includes getting Caleb a snack before he tears apart the entire kitchen. That boy is a truck. Have you seen him? He's in the 99 percentile for weight and for size. So if you don't get him some food, he's going to be angry. It includes getting our baby Lily out of the car seat and into the swing before she gets upset because you can't leave her in the car seat for too long. You know, that just upsets her. And it also includes answering Jane's deep and philosophical questions about life. So when mom gets home, the chaos, it, it seems to start to settle and all just seems to be more right in the world. And I lay on the couch. No, I'm kidding. But uh, Emily and I are much better together than we are on our own. And the same principle applies to God's church and his kingdom. On our own, as individuals, we're not very effective in seeing Jesus' vision for the world come to pass. But when we lock arms together and each play our role, we can make a real dent in the kingdom of darkness. As we consider how we can't stay where we've been, but we need to take hold of what Jesus has for us in 2024, I think the question we all need to consider is this. Am I doing my part to see God's vision fulfilled in the world? Am I locking arms with the church to push back the kingdom of darkness and to bring in the kingdom of light? And my prayer is that each of us would be able to say yes to this question. But before we can answer the question, we have to know what God's vision is. And we see a glimpse of it actually here in Deuteronomy chapter 1. In verse 9, Moses reflects on a moment when he realized that he could not lead Israel on his own. It was too great of a burden for for one man to bear. He says this in verse 9 and 10. He says, at that time I said to you, I'm not able to bear you by myself. I can't do this anymore. Sometimes I say that to my kids. I can't bear you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you. Behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. Not quite that numerous, but feeling like it sometimes. So Moses was overwhelmed. And he realized that the Lord had in fact fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And Abraham, if you didn't know, is the father of the Israelite people. And, and he gave, or God gave Abraham this promise way back in Genesis 15. He said this, he brought him outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. And this is before Abraham had any kids. He's like 100 years old. And God's saying, I want to give you all this offspring, as numerous as the stars in the heaven. So God's vision was to multiply Israel and to make them into a great nation so that they could bless the world. And the idea was that as they loved God with their whole hearts, as they obeyed the law, that the world would be compelled to join in on the worship of the one true God. And Moses, he was getting to kind of taste the fulfillment of this. He, he's getting to start to see it come to pass, and, and he's amazed by it. Although it was difficult to lead them, Moses did not want to change this. He didn't want God uh, to change the multiplication of Israel. It says this in verse 11. It says, May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. So Moses was was thankful that God had fulfilled his promise, and he wanted them to continue multiplying. He didn't ask God to make the vision smaller to accommodate his weaknesses as a leader. Instead, he wanted them to keep multiplying. He, He wanted to see a thousand times more come into God's family. He's like, I know it's hard now, but I want a thousand times more people to come into God's family. And this is still God's vision today. He wants to multiply his people. God's vision is multiplication. He loves multiplication. It's at his very heart. 
And we see it from the very first pages of the Bible. God says, be fruitful and multiply. He wants to fill the earth with people, but specifically, he wants to fill the earth with people who love him, who love each other, and love the world. As this, as this happens, darkness will be pushed back, and light will crash in, and God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven, just like we pray in the Lord's Prayer, you know, or thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So as this happens, the world will begin to look more like heaven. As more people love God and love each other, the world begins to transform and look like heaven. That's God's heart. And, and it's the heart of the great commission that Jesus gave his disciples before he left the earth. He said this in Matthew 28. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so we are called, our calling, our mandate is to go and help others become Jesus' disciples by baptizing them and teaching them. From the very beginning, God has wanted a people who will love him and love others and a people who multiply. This was God's vision for Israel. It's God's vision for the early church. It's God's vision for today. He wants it for us. He wants us to or he wants to see our family multiply as we introduce more people to Jesus. He wants us uh, to see the 100,000 people of the Cedar Valley come to know him. He wants us to be disturbed by the fact that, that 61,000 people in the Cedar Valley are not connected to a church. He wants that to bother us and for us to do something about it to help people become his followers, right? He, he wants us to push back darkness in our community. He wants us to send people out from here to plant the church around the world in places where it's hard. He wants us to raise up people and send them there. God's vision is multiplication, and he wants us to be a part of it. But the problem is, in order for that to happen, it can't just be on one person, right? It can't just be on one person to, uh, to make this happen. And, and, and for the people of Israel in the wilderness, it couldn't just fall on Moses to, uh, to lead this growing group of people. He says this in verse 12. He says, how can I bear by myself the weight of and burden of you in your strife. Okay, so Moses could not possibly handle the burden of leading these people on his own. If he was going to make it long term as their leader, and if they were going to realize their full potential in the promised land, they needed to figure something else out. God's vision is always too big for just one person to handle or for a few people to handle. God's vision is always too big for one person to handle on their own. In general, here's the thing. Hear me this morning. If a vision is from God, it's going to be beyond your resources. If it's from God, it's going to be beyond your own abilities, and it won't be able to be accomplished by just one person. There may be a figurehead or a person out in front leading, but any great thing that has happened in the world has happened because a group of people stepped up and locked arms together to make it happen. Okay, so with that in mind, what is the solution to the vision being too big for one person to handle? What's the solution? Well, let's look at what Moses did. Verse 13 says, choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads, and you answer me that thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So he took the heads of your tribes, the wise and experienced men, and set them as heads over you. It goes on, uh, commanders of thousands, hundreds, uh, fifties, tens. And I charged your judges at the time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously. You get the point. So he points these judges to lead, uh, to help lead Israel. So instead of asking God to make his vision smaller, Moses adapted to what God was doing. He adapted to the vision. He realized that in order for the people of Israel to keep multiplying, he needed to raise up leaders and delegate authority to them. Okay, so the solution to Moses' burden was more people who could take responsibility for the work. And, and we see the sentiment in the New Testament as well. In Matthew 9, Jesus is doing ministry. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's introducing people to God. He's caring for needs. And it says this in verse 36 of chapter 9. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, you get a glimpse right here into Jesus' heart. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
Okay, so when Jesus saw the crowds of people who did not know him, his heart hurt. That word for compassion is a strong word. It's like his heart is churning within him. And they desperately needed a shepherd. And they needed him is what they needed, but they needed under shepherds as well who could help represent Jesus to them. And what they needed was kingdom laborers. I'm gonna use that term today. Kingdom laborers who would rise up and help lead them. And the same is true today. There is such a harvest out there in the Cedar Valley and in the world of people who will follow Jesus if we give them the opportunity, if we give them the care that they need to grow up into Christ likeness. But the problem is the harvest is greater than the laborers. We need more laborers and we need less spectators. We need less bench warmers, right? We need more workers. And that's why Jesus urged the disciples, pray for more laborers. Every morning when you're spending time with Jesus, pray and say, Lord, raise up laborers for the harvest field. Raise them up. Help me to be an answer to that prayer. Our heart and our passion has to be to be an answer to this prayer. It's the only way that God's vision for multiplication is going to be realized. If we want to take hold of God's vision of multiplication, we must become kingdom laborers. If we're going to see the people of God multiply, if we're going to see people become like Jesus, we cannot just rely on one person or a few people. Instead, we need an army of kingdom laborers to rise up. And the very vision of God depends on it. If we want to see it realized, we need all hands on deck. A great way to think of this is the executive branch of the United States government. Okay, we have a president who's the head of state, the commander-in-chief of the United States military. He's responsible to have the final say on the most important decisions, right? However, he doesn't do the job on his own, does he? He could not do that. He has to delegate much of his work and decisions to other people. He has a vice president who can take his place if he's unable to serve and who also serves as the head of the Senate and has the tie-breaking vote in the Senate. And the president can, or can delegate important decisions to the VP. And not just the VP, he has cabinets and, and secretaries that are in charge of the different departments, like the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, Agricultural, Commerce, other departments that you've never heard of. Under each of these secretaries are literally thousands and thousands of employees. Uh, the Secretary of State, for instance, oversees 70,000 employees. It's a lot of employees. And the Treasury oversees 80,000 employees, and the Department of Defense has, has millions of people in their department. On top of all of this, the president has an executive office of the president, and, and, and the EOP has, has numerous responsibilities, including everything from communicating the president's message to the American people and promoting our trade interests abroad. The EOP is overseen by the White House Chief of Staff and is home to many of the president's closest advisors. The current EOP employs over 1,800 people alone. Okay, so this is somewhat of a picture of the way the kingdom of God is supposed to work. It's not supposed to just be about one person, right? It's not just about the president. Instead, the kingdom moves forward as everybody does their job, right? We can't just rely on paid pastors or missionaries to do the work of the kingdom, in Ephesians 4, Paul said this, he said, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the, of the body of Christ. So Paul clearly lays out here that church leaders are actually not supposed to do all the work of the ministry, but instead we are supposed to equip the people or the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay, so with that in mind, my job as senior pastor or lead pastor or lead shepherd, whatever you want to call it, of this church and the job of our pastoral staff is not to do all the ministry. It's not to do all the praying for people, all the caring for people. It's, it's not to do everything, but instead it's actually more so to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Okay, so whether that be equipping you to do the work of the ministry inside this church or outside this church in the streets, our job is to help you step into everything that God has for you as a minister, because we're all ministers. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a minister of the gospel. Right, you are called to preach the gospel. You're called to cast out demons. You're called to heal the sick. God has commissioned you to go and make disciples of all nations. And my job is to help make that happen, to help you do that more successfully. Each of us has different roles and responsibilities, but it is vital that every single one of us does our part. It's vital that we become kingdom laborers who partner with Jesus in completing his task uh, to disciple the nations. 
Okay, so with that in mind, the question remains, how exactly do we become kingdom laborers? And there's a lot I could say. We could do a 52-part series on this. I said that last week about last week's question. I'm saying it again today. We could do it, a whole thing on this. But I'm just going to give you two things, right? Two simple things. The first thing is this. If you want to be a kingdom laborer, you've got to be a servant and don't be a spectator. Come on. Be a servant, not a spectator. If you want to be a laborer for the kingdom of God, you have to labor. It's in the name. You've got to do some work, right? You have to get your hands dirty. You've got to serve. This week I was reading the Gospel of Mark, and in chapter 10, James and John are asking Jesus, they're like, hey, so what do you think about us uh, sitting at your right hand and at your left hand in glory? And the other 10 disciples are angry. They're like, how dare you? We want those spots. And Jesus took this opportunity to teach the 12 a valuable lesson. He said this, he said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. I'm the leader. I'm in charge. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus, he says right here, he says, if you want to be great, you've got to serve. The truly great ones in the kingdom of God are not about their authority or lording it over people. Like, oh, listen to me, I'm the boss. But they're about serving other people. And the first in the kingdom are slaves of all. You know, Jesus himself, he did not come to serve, but, or, or not to be served, but to serve. And he, he models this in John 13. You know, just before he's crucified, he gets on his hands and knees and he washes the disciples' feet and he tells them, you gotta do this as well for each other. And this is a picture of how we're supposed to live as Jesus' disciples. We have to be willing to get our hands dirty. Okay, so serving, it isn't just doing the things you want to do. Right, it's not just, oh, oh, what makes me feel fulfilled. Sometimes you just got to do the stuff. Right, this morning, our locks were frozen outside our our church doors. And Pastor Noah was here at 6 o'clock to open the doors He figured it out. He got it open. Praise God for Pastor Noah. But that's what a servant looks like, right? Getting here early, saying, I'm going to go get WD-40. If that doesn't work, I'm going to try to, you know, pile through the snow back here and get through the back door. Whatever has to happen, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to serve. Serving is not just doing the things you want to do. And I think we really need to hear that. Specifically, and I, I think I'm a part of the younger generation. I'm 30. Okay, you make your judgment. But especially the younger generation. You know, I think the older generation has more of that duty in them. Like, I'm going to do the right thing. You know, I'm going to do it even if it's hard. But us younger people, it's not all about your passions all the time. Sometimes you just got to do the hard stuff, right? You just got to do it. Because no one else is there to do it. You got to do it. Right? So let's do that. But at the same time, we do want you to serve in your giftings and, your, and, and reach your potential. Right? So it's not just like, you know, do stuff you hate all the time. <laughs> Never have any fulfillment in serving. No, we want you to serve... And your gifts, and actually that's part of what Activate's about, is helping you figure out where your gifts are and get you plugged in in the right place. You know, I, I love preaching God's word. I'm glad the Lord lets me do something I enjoy doing, and I want you to do something that you enjoy doing as well. So it's both and. There's the duty and there's the passion, right? So if we want to become kingdom leaders, we, or kingdom laborers, we have to actually do the stuff of the kingdom. We can't just sit on the sidelines. Here at Scent Church, we have a saying, uh, or no one sits on the bench. Right? You don't get to ride the pine. Right? I'm not going to let you get splinters on your behind. Get your butt in the game. I love what Theodore Roosevelt said this, or, or said in 1910. He said, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. So no, this morning, sweat, blood, yelling at the lock who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short and again because there's no effort without error or shortcoming, but who, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause. It's okay if you're tired at night. It's okay. It's okay if you spend yourself and pour yourself out for something, if it's a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails by doing greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who, who, knew, ne- or who knew neither uh, defeat or victory. 
All right, we have to go beyond having opinions or analyzing other people who are in the arena and actually get into the arena ourselves. We have to be a people who actually do something about the darkness in the world. We have to be servants. Okay, so this week, I'm sure you heard if you pay attention to football, but Bill Belichick is resigned, or he resigned from the Patriots. They, I think they mutually agreed to part ways, and he's going to coach somewhere else, but, but you know, his main journey is over at this point. And, and he coached for 24 seasons, has six Super Bowl rings, and I think that his coaching philosophy could be summed up in one sentence. Do your job. Do your job. He always said that. Do your job. If we all do our jobs, then we're going to win the game. And I think he had something to that because he won six Super Bowls and appeared in two more. Okay, so, so it's the same in the kingdom. If we each do our job and are willing to serve, we will win against the kingdom of darkness. All right, the first step to being a kingdom laborer is to actually serve and not just spectate. But it goes a step further than that. As you're doing this stuff with the kingdom, people should look at your life and say that they want to be like you. Be someone worth imitating. Right? If you're doing all the stuff, if you're serving, you're doing all the duty, but you're a jerk, you're not really helping the kingdom. Be someone worth imitating. I think one of the best ways to labor for the kingdom of God is to be an example of what Jesus can do in a person. It's to live a life of love. It's to be a walking example of Jesus. It's to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this is one of the ways that the apostle Paul advanced the kingdom. He became like Christ and said, hey, you can follow my example. I have no problem with you imitating me. He said this in verse Corinthians 11. He said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. The greatest gift we can give others is our changed selves. I think the greatest gift we can give others is to be someone who others can imitate. They can look at your life and say, I want to be like you. That's the greatest gift you can give. Uh, Peace Cazero said this in his book, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. He said, he said, when we disciple or lead others, we essentially give away who we are, specifically who we are in God. We give away who we are on the inside. We give away our presence. We give our journey with Jesus. And this means we can only give away what we possess, which is the life we actually live each day. Are you comfortable asking other people to imitate you? Are you okay with that? Could you say that with the Apostle Paul? Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. The key to seeing God's vision for the, world, for the world fulfilled is to actually be his disciple. It's to be a compelling picture to the world of what God can do in a person. I think Jesus' greatest legacy was not the crowds that he touched or the great sermons that he preached, but it was the, it was the disciples closest to him who he poured his life into. Right? They became like him, and then they gave away that to other people. If we want to see God's vision of kingdom multiplication come to pass in the Cedar Valley and around the world, it starts with each of us stepping up and becoming kingdom laborers who look like Jesus. The work of the kingdom is too much for one or two people or a few people to be responsible for. We all have to take responsibility, and we do this by actually doing the stuff of the kingdom and actually being like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? Come on. That's a good word this morning. We do the stuff, and we be like Jesus. All right, the worship team, you guys can come up now. I've had the privilege of helping pioneer two ministries. The first one, obviously, was Chi Alpha at UNI and now Ascent Church. And in both instances, my experience was very similar. In some ways, it felt like I was living my life over again when we planted the church. Like, oh, just doing the same. It's like 2015 is when we re-pioneered Chi Alpha. 2020 is when we did Ascent Church. I'm like, I feel like I'm back in 2015 again in some ways. And, and in both experiences, when we started, it was just a handful of people trying to get something going. Right? I remember being at the Hilton Garden Inn in some of those cold mornings with the blowtorch, just trying to get the, the trailer to open. Right? We had a little bit of that this morning, but but not quite, just a few people trying to get it going. And in Chi Alpha, it was a ragtag group of, of about a dozen students who were left from, from when Chi Alpha got started the first time, and they wanted to see it reestablished on the campus. And we said, okay, all of you are leaders. You all have a small group. Let's go and see what happens. At Sen, it was the college students of Chi Alpha and then a couple families who helped get it going. At first, in both experiences, our impact was very limited because we had a limited number of laborers. Over time, though, 
As more people said yes to Jesus' call to become kingdom laborers, we multiplied and had greater impact. And we're seeing this today. Okay, so here's the thing. Chi Alpha is gone at Winter Conference today. I don't know if you could tell, but the staff and students are all gone. So it's like you get snow apocalypse, cold apocalypse, and Chi Alpha's all gone. I'm like praying this week. I'm like, only God. It's the only way church happens on Sunday. And a year ago, even without the cold and all that, we wouldn't have been able, well, we weren't able to put up a whole worship team uh, without Chi Alpha being here. And we actually had to have Cross Point Church. They always seem to be bailing us out, but uh, uh, we had to have Cross Point Church come and help us with worship. And today we got all sent church people doing worship today. And we have a worship team leading down in Lincoln, Nebraska right now because our Kyle team leads worship for the conference. So it's pretty amazing just to see how we're able to have a greater impact because more people have answered the call to serve. More people have stepped into serving and into saying, hey, I'm not just gonna come spectate. I'm gonna actually do the stuff. As we step into this new season as a church, you know, with our church merger and our upcoming move, I can't help but think that Jesus is calling some of you to step up in a new way so that the kingdom can go forward in the Cedar Valley. And for some of you, that looks like saying yes to serving. It looks like, like saying, hey, I'm gonna go through Activate so I can figure out my giftings and where I fit the best at Scent Church. And it looks like serving on the cleaning team or the cafe team or the kids ministry or becoming a community leader at some point or serving on the worship team. If you're interested in any of those things, I encourage you to do Activate if you haven't done it yet, or if you have done Activate and just haven't started serving, okay, it's time, jump in, right? We want you to serve. But in general, it's not just about serving here in the context of the four walls. It also looks like just being a servant in everyday life. It, it could look like taking time to invest in other people throughout the week, opening up your home to have a meal with somebody or getting coffee with someone. It could look like studying the Bible with someone who's, who's a little behind you in their faith journey and, and and you could give them something and help them in their, their Bible study or their prayer time. It could look like a number of things, but the point is, is saying, I don't exist for other people to serve me. I don't exist to just fill my own needs. I exist to serve other people. If you have that posture, I promise you, God will give you opportunities to serve. Okay, so no matter what it is, commit to being a person who serves. Commit to not allowing life to just be about you. Pour yourself out for the building of the kingdom of God. And for, the, and for others of you, it looks like I'm stepping into actually being someone worth imitating. Okay, maybe you know a ton about Jesus. You know the Bible front and back, but you don't actually live like him. If that's you, it's time to go beyond head knowledge. Right? Head knowledge, it's, it's helpful, right? It can help us you transform and all of that. But if you, don't have the, if you don't have the fruit of the spirit, if you don't actually live like Jesus, it's all for nothing. There comes a time where you have to say, I'm committed to actually becoming like Jesus. And, and that looks like spending time with Jesus every single day. You have to be in his presence if you want to be like him. It looks like confessing your sin. We're gonna fall short. No one is asking you to be perfect. Being someone worth imitating oftentimes is not being perfect or morally flawless. It's actually saying, I'm willing to own my weaknesses and sharing that with other people saying, hey, I, I miss the mark, because as you share that, it actually frees other people up to say, hey, yeah, I miss the mark too. And, and when you confess your sins to one another and believers pray for you, that's where you find healing and transformation. So for some of you, maybe it looks like confessing sin. It could be a number of things, but the point is don't stay where you've been and refuse the status quo and say, I'm going to take hold of Jesus' vision by becoming a kingdom laborer, which looks like serving and it looks like actually being like Jesus. Uh, let's go ahead and stand all across this room. As we say yes to being kingdom laborers, as we answer the call, we're going to see God's vision of multiplication burst into being. We're already seeing it. And I see what's happening this morning is beautiful. We're seeing it right now, right? We have like, our church is like in two places right now and we're doing it, right? It's amazing. And, and many people couldn't even get here this morning because of the snow. We're seeing it. As we commit to say, hey, we're gonna be kingdom laborers, God's vision can come to pass. We don't have to say, hey, God, lower your vision for us because we can't handle it. Instead, we adapt to his vision and say, God, God, we know you wanna reach more people in the Cedar Valley. We know you wanna just, just bring even that, even that one more person to you. God, help us to step up. Help us to be the laborers that you've called us to be so we can see that happen. We don't want to take the things that God has given us, like the parable of the talents, like take the talent he's given us and put it under a bowl and be like, oh, we just kind of want to hunker down and just be about us. No, instead, 
And said, so we want to see God's vision multiply. We want to see more and more people come to know Jesus. But for that to happen, we have to commit to this. As we commit to it, we're going to see the people of God become, or become more numerous than the stars of the sky in the Cedar Valley. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Are you fired up yet this morning? Oh, come on. Like, we're here at church. That's the vision. Right? I want to look up in, in the night sky and say, wow. I, I, like that's a picture of how many people have come to know Jesus in the last year. I want to be able to do that. I want to have the heart that says, God, just one more. Help us to reach one more. But for that to happen, we all have to step up. We all have to say, I'm going to be a person who's for the one, for the city, for the world. I'm going to be a person who lays my life down. So let's go ahead and pray here. Prayer team can come up here at the front. If you want to bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to give you a couple ways to respond this morning. I just want to give you two ways. And and really, we're just going to kind of zero in on those two application points. The first thing being serving. The second thing being someone worth imitating. And for you this morning, maybe Jesus is calling you outside of your comfort zone. He's calling you to be a person who says, I'm going to pour myself out to see other people come to know you, to see other people grow in you. If that's you, can you slip up your hand right now and say, hey, I just want to serve. I just want to be someone who serves. I want to be someone who lays my life down. I got my hand up. I want to be someone who pours myself out, someone who, who's not afraid to get uncomfortable. So let's go ahead and just pray as you have your hands up to heaven. Lord, Uh, Right now, see our hands. Lord, see the hands of these people in this room and and the hands of those online. And Lord, meet us right where we're at. We want to be people who serve. We want to be people who do hard things. God, help us to not be about our own comfort zones, but to be a people who are just fixated on seeing as many people as possible come to know you and grow up into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Go ahead, put your hands down. The second thing is this. If you're just like, hey, I want to commit to this process of becoming like Jesus. I I want to be someone worth imitating. I want to be someone who's patient like he is and, and who's loving and gentle like he is. I, I want to be someone who, who models Christ to my community. If that's you, can you slip up your hand right now? Just being bold. Yeah, I got my hand up too. All right, Lord, right now we come to you and we just say we want to look like you. Like God, God, and when we go out into our community, we want to just be a, like a living example of, of what you look like. And Lord, it starts with confession of our sins. We confess that each of us had missed the mark. I know I missed the mark. I may have missed the mark yesterday yelling at one of my sons for hitting my daughter. But hey, no one needs to know about that. Lord, help me. (laughs) Lord, forgive us for our sins. For... uh, Forgive us for those times when we don't live up to your example. but, But also help us to grow up into maturity. To grow up into your likeness. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's go ahead. Let's worship the Lord. The altars are open. We'll have a little time of worship here at the end, and then we'll close in a few minutes.